first world order radio finally finally we are on the air no doubt all right all right there's always gonna be somebody in the building on first world order radio Get on into some of that Buddha consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is eight o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance, the most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, and in definite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, and in definite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories. Shit that works. No doubt. Playtime is over, and we back once again with First World Order Radio. Your host, Dr. Aileen Bay, as well as also my co-host, Brother Fahim L. Are you here? Peace, Dr. Aileen. How you doing tonight? All right, peace. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, I'll tell you what to each. All right. I'll tell you what to each, more. All right, all right. Um, we got a good well. show tonight. Oh, yeah, we have a good show tonight, no doubt about it. Um, we got a very special guest. You know, sister, been dropping information for a while. She's going to be talking on the Temple of Dendera, and the Rites of Passage, um, as well as also many other little things like, for example, um, methods for developing your latent abilities, um, as well as also um, the Washita, all right? So she's going to be doing mm. that information, all right? So um, we're getting ready to bring the sister on, the goddess on. This is Sister Jewel L. Bay. Greetings. Peace. Peace. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Good, 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 good. Peace. I'm glad to be How you on. Doing? Thank you for the time. Great. I'm doing very well. Very busy. Um, All right. I know. Too. Thank we you. Are. <laughs> All right. So you want to deal with us tonight about the rites of passage program in which that you have going on? Let's um, let's talk about that first. Okay, uh, well, the Temple of Dendra Rites of Passage Program is a training system uh, for African daughters. Um, we're adjusting it. Uh, this is something that I've done uh, for several years at the um, um, Underground Railroad in Burlington, New Jersey. We're moving it now to Philadelphia um, to help the young sisters there to get more in touch with themselves as women. And young girls, um, this is an initiation into femininity, into womanhood, um, understanding the culture of femininity, and um, giving them information not only about their bodies and, you know, adjusting from being a young lady or a little girl from childhood into becoming uh, an an adolescent as well as an adult. Um, Encourage the mothers to help out as much as possible because 
the way that I do it, I don't want it to be something where they, you know, just get a piece of kente cloth at the end of this. I want this to be something that, you know, the community is involved in and something that they'll cherish forever. Um, the girls that I've initiated so far, according to their mothers, um, the methods that I use and the things that the girls do when we're not together, because um, this upcoming session is going to be uh, basically run like a summer school or a summer camp type of thing. Um, and what happens is that the girls are brought in, they um, they get, you know, accustomed to, you know, etiquette and um, different different levels of art of being a woman, um, and they're, they're allowed to ask any of the questions that they may have. And one of the reasons why this is so helpful is because, um, you know, each mother has her own mothering style, but um, little girls may have questions that they don't feel comfortable asking their mothers or their mothers may not be comfortable with answering all the questions. Um, so this actually um, is a format where we're prepared to answer, you know, any questions that they'll have, um, we take them on field trips to, you know, the museums. Um, we have girl talk. We do um, very – well, we talk about various things about African womanhood especially so that they don't feel overwhelmed with, you know, things that are in the media that tell them that they have to be anything other than them. And then also the main point of uh, the Temple of Gender Rights and Passage program um, it's in the name itself. The Temple of Dendra has to do with um, Semitic cosmology, meaning uh, Het Haru. When the Temple of Dendra, that um, the original zodiac system or the, the viewing of it, that's where that comes from. So the, the essence of this whole program is to know thyself, and that's um, the essential uh, aspect that I want to convey to the little girls is to, you know, whatever situation they, they encounter in life is to make sure that they're true to themselves, but this program helps them become more in tune with that, not only as um, a girl growing into her femininity, but being able to correctly identify femininity, being comfortable with her Africanness, you know, the dark skin tone, the, the lips, the hips, the, you know, the eyes, the hair, all of these things are very sensitive for even adult women. So this is um, a format to help them be very comfortable with themselves and each other. This helps to develop sisterhood, um, and it's, I'm very excited about it. I do have uh, a lot of help this time, um, so I'm looking forward to it, and we'll be putting more information out uh, soon. All right, no doubt about it. Um, is what, I mean, tell the people, you know, what they can do in order to help or help, you know, as well solidify, you know, uh, what's going on, because that's something in which that is very important as far as um, getting a handle on our youth and teaching them the proper information and the right path in order to go in life, you know. Um, so tell the audience, you know, what you know what we need to do as far as, um, you know, uh, also, you know, give out your number, give out, you know, the way that we can contact you in order to um, get more information and everything. All right, hold on just a second, please. What the what the audience can do is mainly um, how I got involved into this was um, through a lot of research. Um, I was looking for a rights of passage system for myself. I got involved with the um, Queen of Food Sacred Woman process and um, learned about the gateways. I got involved with being able to do altar work um, and being in touch with myself as far as being you know being a spiritual person. Um, but other folks can do to help this endeavor um, is to, you know, not be afraid to help little girls along. Um, I will be posting up information on Facebook. Um, and also, if you're in the Philadelphia area, um, we're going to be putting out information about this. Um, also, if you're not in the area, all right now I'm writing a textbook um, we're revising the textbook and the girls' workbook. Um, so um, I know with the wash it's all, we're um, definitely behind this as far as being able to 
you know, if, when we talk about uplifting fallen humanity, one of the things about that is to help each individual feel more in tune with themselves. So um, what other folks can do mainly is to, you know, stay tuned for more information. Also, you know, don't be afraid to just start, you know, uh, sister circles where you invite the young ladies in because I know as women, you know, we have a lot on our plate and we have these sister circles in these different areas and regions that we're in. We, we talk about grown women issues. Um, but some of those things aren't, it's not really necessary to hide from the little girls. Some of those things, you know, just for them to hear, you know, what a woman goes through, it helps them to really value their position as a child. That's one thing that I definitely have noticed in um, doing this Right to Passage program. It helps them really, um, really uh, not want to go up too fast. So, um you know, for those of you that have nieces and daughters and granddaughters, um, it, it's it's really important to, you know, help them get in touch with their feelings. Don't let them, you know, take on the burdens of the world by themselves. Just feel, um, help them feel more connected to you. Um, and that, within that, you know, just letting them know that they have a support system is essential. Um, even if you don't have a right to passage program in your area, in your area, there's different ways that you can start it up. And that's a basic that's a basic way to do that because the community is supposed to support, you know, the, the children, and the, the children are supposed to feel that support. So, you know, um, take a, as long take as you have to raise that, a child. Peace? Now, I'm just saying take a village to raise a child. Yes, it does. Um, mm-hmm. So those are some of the things that, that other people can do to um, – to, to raise awareness about this, um, I know that there's different um, different rites of passages all over the country. Um, the the way that I do mine, you know, as a high priestess, the the initiations are very important. The lessons are very important. Making sure that they understand these things and um, they get the value of this. Also, uh, some of what we do is a little bit of, uh, I guess, re-educating or cleansing of the mind because. Once I've noticed also that once our girls hit a certain age, around 13 or 14, they really believe themselves to be valueless, worthless. Their confidence is shot, and um, it's very important for each family that has a little girl, and especially a melanated little girl, that you know you defend her self-esteem um, as much as possible, because if she starts to identify with the wrong things or if she's, you know, overwhelmed with um, negative imagery, whether it be in a school setting about her ancestors um, or in, you know, media or in, um, you know, movies, magazines, if she's, you know, hanging out with other little girls that believe this, then, you know, it's going to be more difficult for her to really um, honor herself, feel that she should respect herself and command that from other people. Um, so, you know, that's just a little bit of a word to the wise when you're, you know, entering this arena of helping little girls along, uh, developing their their uh, adulthood and femininity and womanhood. Right. What are some of the things in which that you teach during the Rites of Passage? Can you speak on any of that? You know, just give us a, you know, a little taste of it so the audience can get okay. some type of idea. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the main things that really helps um, as far as character development is that make sure that the young ladies do the 42 laws of my eye. We explain to them what that is, that um, that in the morning, you know, you say certain things such as, you know, I will not lie, I will not steal, I will not, um, you know, dishonor my teachers, I will not dishonor myself, I won't disrespect anyone, I won't cause anyone harm, I won't force anyone to cry unjustly. So it's basically developing character traits. Also, it's, you know, those are affirmations that right. teaching the, the young person to be um, commanding in their presence and to develop virtuous characteristics um, and actions and to practice that every day. The mothers that have participated in the program have told me that, you know, even after the program is over, that mm-hmm. their daughters continue with that. They help out more around the house. They don't complain as much. They don't seem like, you know, irresponsible kids. They don't whine and complain as much, and they really um, take on the the concept that they're growing up 
is also um, in this aspect that helps the, um, you know, giving them more responsibilities. When you really look at it this this way as a parent, it helps you to yeah. deal with your, you know, the fact that your child is growing up and they're not going to be your little baby yeah. anymore. You don't have to treat them that way. And then it alleviates some of that stress and tension of feeling like, you know, once they hit a certain age, you're going to have to combat with them every single day. And you're going to have a miserable teenager on your your hands and, you know, you have the alpha female battling with 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 the younger lady. That doesn't have to be that way. It can be an enjoyable process. You know, she can look at mommy as a coach and aunties as, you know, assistant coaches, and she can talk to grandma or whomever that's in her circle. She can, you know, those are the women that are supposed to help guide her, and it can be um, an experience where it's very trusting. Um, that is, you know, things that you can do towards that, you know, um, taking them. Here we have uh, in Philadelphia area, you have the African American Museum. Um, parents mm-hmm. should not be afraid to discuss family history with the youngsters. Um, one of the one of the key things also that we do is we have this um, this uh, assignment where the young girls um, and the mother sit down, and even the you know the aunties or the, the older female cousins can answer questions such as you know when did you know that you were a woman? When did you know that you were a so-called black woman? These are you know different experiences for different women, and um, some women say you know they knew that they were a woman when they first got their period, or um, right. when you know they started to wear a bra, or when they started dating, or when they moved out the house. You know, so right. obviously as a community, there's some redefining that we have to do because. Mm-hmm. Um, when, and when you do a rites of passage program, when you go through it, um, in certain places in the world, if you don't if you don't successfully finish the process, you are not accepted as an adult within that community. Right. And you know, within this community here, that is a that is an issue where you have grown folks that you know are past fifty, but don't exactly have the characteristics of an elder. And then mm. you have you have young folks that, you know, have to battle with their parents because the, the child has more, um, you know, maturity than the parent does. But who's going to step in and, you know, alleviate the stress from the parents and, and all of that on the young person? You see what I'm saying? Right. So, And then you have an external society that says that when this person turns 18, that's when they're an adult or when they turn 21 or when they can go fight in the Army. So um, these these types of situations where you don't have a solidified system set up that says, okay, now you have not only hit this age, but now mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, you've been tested and you've been found worthy to, you know, help make decisions for our adult community for the children to, you know, um, help us empower ourselves. Without that, then you have a a lot of rampant chaos going on and, um, a lot of dishonorable activities that could have been, you know, checked if, you know, people were put in their place by other people. Um, so also with that, you have um, you have uh, within this type of community set up, you have, um, it's an empowering thing not only for the little girls, but also for everyone that helps to guide the little girls along the way because you have to keep yourself in check. You know, it's not just right. about... I mean, I've seen different rights of passage programs that are called rights of passage programs, but it's really, you know, more so for the business development or professional development because it's more so about what's on your resume. Whereas a rights of passage program is more about what's in your heart and if you have one. Um, And being able to interact with each other, being able to develop the sisterhood bond um, is something that's very essential that um, you don't get to, you know, in too many other places where, you know, because of that, because we don't have it on a large scale, you have women that fight against each other um, for silly reasons. The right to pass the program, you have, you know, you have people checking these little girls along the way, making sure they're behaving ladylike. It's more than just about etiquette and, you know, keeping them from, you know, being in the streets or whatever, it's more so about 
developing their their virtuous aspects, making sure that their character is correct, um, helping them to define their own voice and use it. Expression, um, self-expression is very important, um, and it makes it's a, you know how some schools boast about 100% graduation rate. It's very important for us to have that um, as far as our character development is because if we don't have that, then, you know, you have what we have what's going on right now. And um, the young ladies that have gone through the process, you know, afterwards I heard, you know, they get their period and it's not a big deal. It's not something that they're going to freak out about. Because they we've already gone over this, and it's like, oh, I understand what's happening with my body. I understand, oh my goodness, these emotions, and you know, there's still a little bit of stress and tension there, but it's not a totally clueless event. And I've talked to women where, you know, even if they had mommy and daddy in the household, they still, uh, you know, in their 30s and 40s and 50s, are still finding out different things about their body that they did not know that no one told them. So it's not even right. a situation where you're excluded from this situation of needing this type of development if your mother was there for you or if, you know, you had all your aunties around or if you had money. That's not that's not what we're talking about. It's not, you know, it's not really a socioeconomic problem. It's more so a cultural issue because um, right. in, in other countries, in other parts of the world that I've studied, the, the rights of pastors for the little girls, you learn, the woman or the little girl, she'll learn about, Femininity, womanhood within her culture specifically. So that's how you have, what is it, the bat mitzvah, and you have the sweet 16s, um, the Igbo in Nigeria, they have a fattening room where they prepare her to become a bride. They prepare her to learn how to raise her family. And, you know, the major complaint that we have today, one of the taco places that we don't, we don't know how to cook. I mean, I know how to cook, right. but I've heard, <laughs> I've heard that's a, that's a serious that's a serious issue. Well, if you have right. a rights and passion pro- program going on, um, that, you know, and, and the the process of it, how long it takes is really up to the parents, how long they want their daughter in this, you know, um, how the program is run, whether it's a four-year process or a six-year process or, um, you know, the the space that it's that it's going through, whether the the girls come back after they get initiated and help other girls along the way, because it's wow. one experience when how you're going long, through long, it. Right, how long say? is the initiation process? I was saying, how long is the initiation process? The first time I did it, it was a year. Um, mm-hmm. but I would like to move it into being a four year situation. Um, whereas mm-hmm. you have, you know, you have a one year. Um, you have a one-year session, and then you take a break, and then the following year you move up. Um, so I want to spread it out more so that, you know, if a young lady comes in at eight years old, I'm not initiating her into her womanhood when she turns nine. That's not what happens. What happens is she she grows in varying degrees of femininity. Um, traditionally, right. our little girls become women at the age of 14, but that does not mean that they're ready for marriage. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, parents are ready to give them up. It just means that, okay, now we recognize you as more of an adult. You know, you still have some learning to do. You still have your personal goals to accomplish so that you'll have something to build your family upon. And you won't feel like, you know, you have to sow your oats and all, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, And... Taking you know taking uh, the reins of this and making sure that that um, the outside culture does not dominate what your children believe is something that successful nations do. You know they keep their children very close. They don't let any old body teach them. And um, you know the feminine culture is distinct and separate from the masculine culture, but the two you know are parallel. So um, also working to develop a um, boys' rights of passage program. But, you know, as a woman, there's only so much I can do. Um, But I'm also looking for, you know, men that would like to help out with that in the Philadelphia area. All right, all right. Well, um, we should definitely be able to find people in the Philly area, you know, brothers in particular, you know. um, Right. 
let me ask you this question as far as the initiation process. Um, Peace? Yes, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay. I was saying about the initiation process. Um, mm-hmm. As How long does that exactly? Right. Uh, well, with the initiation process, you know, um, I really like that aspect of it, um, where you go through all the classes, the classes, um, where the courses in different areas and subjects, you find the girls' strengths and you help them work on their weaknesses. Weaknesses are not, you know, that they come in with should not be the same weaknesses at the end of it. So this takes, you know, a lot of insight to really read the girls and, um, help them feel more comfortable with themselves so they don't so they're not you know they don't feel incompetent or inferior when they have to deal with the outside world um the initiation once you get to that level um you have what we do is we have um a private ceremony that's usually at one of the family members' house for all the girls um and I mean, there's only so much I can talk about <laughs> because that's the whole point is that, it, you know, the secrecy of it. Um, but there is a, yeah, there is a, a private uh, ceremony that takes place. It's very, um, it's very memorable. Um, right. And you go over, you know, essentially you go over everything that was, or all the main points that you want to make sure that the girls got um, before they they move on to the next level. So there's that, you know, there may be right. some food, um, and it's, you know, certain things are done one at a time, certain things they have to do as a group uh, for bonding experience. And the next day, you know, and then they're given gifts. Um, some of the gifts that they're given are, are waist beads, you know, for chastity and protecting that. Some of the time, sometimes they get um, wrists, or I'm um, sorry, uh, bracelets on their wrists to make sure that, you know, their hands put forth good works. They get anklets to make sure they walk in righteousness. Um, and they get necklaces to make sure they speak, you know, honestly and truthfully in all matters that they're dealing with because, again, the main focus is to develop character. Um, and uh, the next day, usually there is some type of community uh, event. Um, what I had the girls do is walk around uh, the community with their gear on. So they have, you know, their lapis on, they had their ox painted on their you know, over their brow chakra, they have um all of their all of their things on, walking around the community, they maybe singing songs and things like that. That's basically um trying to get the community involved because it's not supposed to be, you know, just me by myself with some girls. It's not, you know, an after school program. This is an actual intensive you know, thorough psychological type of thing that goes on because you're trying to make you're trying to defend how they feel about themselves, um, how they feel about their culture. You want to make sure they honor their family. You want to make sure that you know they honor their community. In the optimal situation, the community will receive you know that the girls are not little children anymore that they've grown somewhat, right. depending on their age, or if they're at that age of 14, that now they are, she's a woman now. Um, right. And then the last day, the last day is usually where you have performances. You may have some more gift giving, that, you know, give thanks to the community, um, and they, they do, or they recite their oath, or they give their vows to be, you know, upright, to you know, right. be leaders within their community and to um, to honor their family, to honor themselves, to honor their creator, um, to honor us. You know, for taking the time to make sure that they understand these principles. And um, right, you know, cosmology. They, I was going to ask this cosmology. I was going to ask the question: Is cosmology, astrology, numerology part of this? Also, as far as um, giving the girls the chance in order to. Um, you know, look at their, you know, birthday or, you know, the times and, you know, and like you said, see their strengths, see their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, that, that's definitely something that I've tried to do at the mother's permission because the thing is that not, um, I don't I don't promote this just for the conscious community because I, I want to make sure that as many young right. girls get this as possible and I'm not, 
you know, I won't use that as a limitation to say, well, your parents only listen to this or they only know about these folks or they call themselves more or they don't call themselves more. It's more so, you know, about the little girl. Um, so if their parents will allow it, I would definitely do um, what I call numerology and astro- astro- astrological um, biography. So essentially I just get their name, birth date, and birth location along with the parents' information and combine that to see how they vibe off of each other and pull out, pull out the, the mother's strengths, pull out the daughter's uh, strengths and also the weaknesses. And also um, this is important because this is a group. So each group of girls is very different from, you know, all the other ones that, that I deal with. Right. Uh, understanding their, you know, their placements, where the signs are and all of that, and who they are numerologically, that um, will help me determine who to put, who to match who with who. Because right. um, the girls are supposed to, you know, they're supposed to have a um, a, a, a sisterhood, not only with the group, but um, I like the way that within the sacred woman system, you have what is called an Imanhet. Your Imanhet is who you would wake up first thing in the morning and call and um, and do your, you know, your altar work in the mornings with. So with the little girls, this is basically, you know, learning how to interact with someone else that's your age because, you know, uh, in certain situations, little so-called black girls will not be able to interact with other little black girls depending on where they live and, um, you know, what's going on in the school system. Um, right. And then, you know, I also want to make sure that they uh, that they learn how to, you know, develop a lifelong friendship that exceeds, you know, the limitations of, you know, their age or um, how long they're in the process, that they're always in contact with the program and that they can come back. Um, there's another sister that has a, a life of passion program up in North Jersey, and I like the way that she's It's called uh, Kijana Kepper, um, and she – deals with them a little bit older. Um, and I've helped with, with her initiation process too. So, um, and we have, you know, we have a, a good system set up so that, you know, whenever she needs assistance or ever I need assistance, um, we can vibe off each other and our, you know, our groups can get together. So you can do that as well. Um, right. Because, you know, and then have, have uh, the girls from different areas meet up because that's a, that's another situation that doesn't happen where, at least in New Jersey, wherever you live, that's where you have to go to school. So when you have programs like this, you get to meet, you know, little girls get to meet girls from other areas, from you know, with different accents and all. So it really opens them up and exposes them to things that they wouldn't otherwise, you know, really ever think about. Right. Well, being a high priestess, um, talking about, you know, being able to also be a sociologist and a psychologist at the same time, um, like what right. you were talking about, but to see the, um, you know, the spiritual essence of the individual and then being able to see their strengths and their weaknesses and then teaching them how to capitalize, you know, you know, um, on their strengths and how to, you know, I guess in a sense, you know, um, work on their weaknesses in order to turn them into strengths, you know, that right. is something in which that, um, you know, we lost as a community. You know, um, is that something in which that, like, you were going to tie in as far as, like, with Washington, which is an indigenous um, nation, um, how would you tie that into that process? Well, being being a high priestess is in the Washington and understanding, you know, aboriginality, um, bringing certain things to light is definitely another aspect of this program that you don't get with too many others. Um, I'm able to introduce different things to them that they would never, <laughs> that they would never otherwise get. Um, with the Washita, you know, um, developing the writing system, they're able to learn an actual Aboriginal uh, language system. They're able to directly interact with, you know, a chieftain that that um, you know has. Uh, a lot of uh, experience in in dealing with these matters as far as being a woman, um, and they can they can 
understand African spirituality from someone that actually practices spirituality. Um, I do the, you know, new moon rituals, uh, full moon rituals. We have sacred day observances. So if their parents allow it, again, if their parents allow it, they can participate in these things. And if not, at least they can they can ask me questions during, you know, the, the times that we meet up. Um, and with this, they can, you know, they have this, um, I can bring out different aspects as far as, you know, learning about, well, which tribe did you come from? Um, not too many other Rise of Passage programs really can um, offer anything other than saying, you know, well, we come from Kemet or we come from, um, you know, Africa, and you should be proud of that. That's very good. That's very good because that's something that you're not going to get in, in most public school systems. Um, but, again, being, you know, understanding my aboriginality, being able to trace my family back for more than 200 years, um, going, you know, being able to go back further than seven generations, knowing that nobody in my family on any side was enslaved or had, you know, um, was enslaved or, or owned any slaves, that we own our own land, I can provide a different aspect other than just, you know, well, yeah, your people were slaves, and that's that's all to that. Um, there's different uh, assignments that I can offer these children to, you know, ask your parents and ask the eldest people in your family, you know, about your family history. That's one thing that I really stress with this um, with this training system um, to, you know, not just say, you know, well, I'm a woman and I'm proud to be, you know, to look the way that I look and I love my hair and I have locks and all of that, but to come at them from a historical standpoint, um, as well as an actual cultural standpoint because other folks are very much allowed to be proud of themselves. They don't have, um, not to say that they don't have to deal with racism, they don't have to deal with sexism and chauvinism and, you know, a massive hide, uh, hiding of their history and um, their, their language and their ancestral lineage and, and being attacked daily. It's not that other folks don't have that, but we're able to introduce different concepts of being themselves um, from a positive uh, standpoint, not from just, you know, I read it somewhere, you know, I've experienced different things, um, and I'm able to explain things in a way that, you know, they're, they're able to understand. It's not something, you know, being indigenous or, or aboriginal, um, and understanding, you know, how far back the actual history goes um, is very important. So we can, you know, point out different books to them and um, help them understand also the power of being a woman, and especially in Washington, having the empress, being able to discuss that and point out different media for that is totally, you know, that's, that's totally outside of mainstream so-called America. Um, right. So that that's how that ties back into um, to the Washita. Also, um, you know, with being, I mean, having a right to pass program, that's something that tribal nations do. That's something that, you know, goes way back. It's not something that's brand new. It's not something, you know, that, okay, well, you know, you're a Pan-African or you're Afrocentric, so that's why you're doing that. You're just, you know, teaching them to be separate. No, no, this is, actually going back to the way of our, you know, foremothers and forefathers, just, you know, going back to living the way that we actually did, those things have to be taught and trained to us. And, you know, some things are going to be new because we don't know every single thing, but we can try is the main thing. Yes. Um, so those are those are just some aspects of how, you know, being an Aboriginal and being a chieftain and being a high priestess ties into all of this because the main thing, one of the major points of, of Washington is culture and personal development. Um, you know, not just saying, you know, well, I'm, you know, in, 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 a, in a lot of nobility, but actually being that, behaving that way. That's something that for some people it has to be trained to them because there's too many outside influences to say that, you know, your conduct doesn't really matter, and it just all that matters is how much you got in your pocket and, you know, how powerful you are and your power really amounts to, you know, how forceful you are. That's not really the Washington way. 
Um, so in that aspect, all of that, you know, is very helpful um, because your culture is supposed to be, you know, you see other, I, I feel like sometimes I see monks walking around, I see Sufis walking around, and your, not only your religion and your spirituality, but your culture itself is supposed to help you. This is why, you know, um, I mean, just coming to think about, you know, the Great Wall of China, why would you keep people outside and, and why would you maintain all of these, you know, like I watch a lot of um, movies that glorify, you know, uh, ancient or I guess what you would call medieval times of Asians being, you know, empresses and emperors. We don't really have too much of that. That's not. I can't really go on Netflix and see that. It look like me wearing, you know, uh, having you know court positions and being emperors and being, you know, adored by their people and all that. Those are stories that I have to tell these. Excuse me. I have to tell these little girls. Um, so you know, being a person that you know is trying to get back into that and can you know speak with it and speak about these things with enthusiasm to the little girls, that really helps them feel proud of themselves because they're not going to get that too many other places. And that's what right. I'm saying um, with the age uh, cutoff. I've noticed that little girls that hit about 13, they no longer are willing to believe that, you know, you come from kings and queens and empresses and emperors and your people own this land and this land and the other. They don't want to hear it. So this is why right. you have to start getting at them very young. Um, and best believe is like if we don't get them very young, somebody else will. And at a certain right. point, it gets very, it gets very difficult. And like I said, you know, very successful cultures and very successful nations use their culture, their spiritual system, their sciences, you know, their educational system, how they eat, what they cook, what they wear. All of these things are guided and intricate, and it wasn't for nothing. A lot of folks think, you know. You go back in history, all that stuff is nonsense. Okay, then how come most other nations really maintain certain aspects and you only really understand a person on certain levels uh, based on what they do every day? You know, certain cultures and different people around the world have specific things that they do to keep themselves successful, to connect themselves with their ancestors, and they're not, um, they don't, they're not being told that they have to assimilate um, on the on the same degree that we're told that we have to just forget all that, give it up. You know, there's nothing back there but you know uh, bad memories and slavery. And why would you want to learn about your history? Um, right. And that's you know that's a very that's taken up with the fetus type of mode, um, which is why, like I said, I have the the girls uh, look into their family history because you know a lot of us don't share that, and some of us do, even if you do have that um, that type of history as, you know, as far as being enslaved or having owned enslaved, even if you have that, there's things beyond that and before that that you can cling to that can really make you feel very, very proud of yourself and to help your children, right. you know, walk around with dignity and integrity and really feel like they can accomplish something. Instead of walking around feeling like that's it, that's all that they ever were, that's all that they ever amount to, um, and that within itself is psychological welfare. So, you know, this kind of thing is very important to me um, and to the little girls that actually have participated in it. They really enjoy themselves. They really like, you know, um, being a toward and feeling that loving energy from a grown-up woman that looks like them. They respond to that very well. Um Okay. And a lot of times they don't want to leave <laughs> because, you know, the um, there's not too many situations or places or locations where they're looked at like that. Um, and, you know, if you can set something up like that within your community and if you want some assistance, um, you can email me and we can talk about it. Um, my email address is yabazagardens at gmail.com, and that's spelled Y-A-B as in boy, U, Z as in zebra, A, G as in gardens, A, R, D as in David, E as in elephant, N as in nation, S as in Sam, G. 
gmail.com. Okay, so give it to him one more time. Yabuza Gardens is Y A B is in boy. U Z is in zebra. A G as in gardens. A R D is in David. E N as in nation. S as in Sam. At gmail dot com. God is Jules L. Bay, and she's building on the Temple of Ventura, the Rites of Passage program. And we had a question in which that we wanted to go into about the Sun, Moon, Rising Star Homeschool Association. So we're going to get her on that topic, and um, then we're going to open up the lines. And for those who want to call in, it's 626-414-3535. That's 626-414-3535. Give us a call. Got it. Ready to ask you about that Sun Moon Rising Star Homeschool Association. What's going on with that? Well, that's a, a the Homeschool Association is uh, mainly a resource uh, group. It's a support system for um, families and their children that homeschool within the Philadelphia area. When I say Philadelphia area, I am talking about Camden, um, New Jersey, um, and surrounding areas. We say Philadelphia because everybody recognizes that. Um, we do have members within New Jersey. I am one of them. Um, and this is a um, a group where we get together. We can we do science projects with our with our children, um, and we get together. We go to one of the things that we, the next thing that we have actually coming up is on the first Wednesday of the month. We usually try to meet up at the um, uh, Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia, and um, we gather there to, you know, um, meet new mothers that are interested in joining. Um, and, again, this is not a homeschool board of education. This is a support group for mothers and fathers, families and children that are homeschooling because, um, you know, across the board, studies show that homeschool, homeschool children actually perform better you know, on uh, tests, standardized tests, that they're, you know, more mature when they're dealing with different age groups, um, that they're, you know, they appear to be better behaved. And um, the the only downfall that that the stereotype is about homeschool children is that they don't socialize and they don't, um, you know, know how to uh, deal with people in, you know, social such, social situations. Um, so this is why, you know, myself and a couple other mothers have um, de- developed this this uh, support system so that the children can get together uh, for the main purpose of socializing. We do um, different activities together. Um, you know, we have we're planning on doing birthday parties, and um, we uh, we uh, just started this um, last autumn, actually. Started last autumn, um, and you know we're still going through planning certain things that we want to do. But for the main point is that you know we get together, we have fun. This is not supposed to be a stressful type of situation. You know the mothers, um, all the mothers that are members have their own system of how they train their child at home, or how they educate their child at home. Some mothers, um, especially within the Philadelphia area or within the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, there's certain rules that they have that are much stricter than rules about homeschooling in New Jersey. So, you know, the laws and things like that, that's another uh, resource that we offer information about, whereas um, at a certain time in Philadelphia, you actually had to, you know, you as a parent had to become a certified homeschooler. Um, it's not so much like that anymore, but they still, <clears throat> compared to New Jersey, where you basically only have to present, you know, your curriculum and, and, you know, kind of prove that your child has, you know, completed work that's equivalent or greater than, you know, their public school counterpart is doing whatever their, you know, at whatever their age is at the time. Other than that, having basically to prove that you are working with your child and your child is as smart as they would be, if not smarter than if they were going to public or private school, um, 
you really aren't bothered about it. Whereas, you know, in Philadelphia, you're kind of monitored heavily. Um, where they have, you know, uh, testing at different points to make sure that your child is, you know, on par or, you know, performing at a certain level depending on where they're at. Um, so when we get together at the Homeschool Association, it's more so about just getting together and making sure that the kids have fun um, and, you know, giving each other resources about, you know, different sites that we can use on the Internet. Uh, we do have a Facebook group. Uh, you can uh, go and look for it. It's actually just called Sun, Moon, Rising Stars Homeschool Association, um, and you can like us on Facebook. Excellent, excellent. Of course, my wife and I raised our son um, in our homeschool program called Learning Peacefully for many, many years. Um, so that's actually is a good thing. Um, do y'all also offer um, vaccination exempt forms or information concerning that? We we mainly we uh, offer information about um, different tools that that you can use when it comes to those types of things. We really haven't had to um, to bump into that yet because in New Jersey, that's not you know if you're homeschooling, then it's a different situation, whereas, you know, you, you're training in your home, so you obviously, you know, you're as a parent, um, your child's medical history and, you know, the shots and all that, that's your business. Um, in Philadelphia, I haven't really heard that come up yet in any of our meetings, um, but, you know, when certain issues like this come up, we basically just look it up. <laughs> we look it up and try to help each other um, so it's not so much pressure on, you know, the moms because, you know, as a mother, you know, and if you're a wife, you have all kinds of issues going on, whether you're a wife or whether you're single, and you have other issues, you know, that are pressing that you have to tend to other than just training your child and educating your child. Um, so that's why uh, this, this uh, homeschool association is so helpful because I know for me, the only thing that I used to do with my son was um, – was, you know, taking up like four hours a day. <laughs> Training him four hours a day, you know, and my son is he's about to be five years old. Um and, you know, one of the other homeschool moms she said, you know, that you don't have to you don't have to use, you know, four hours a day, you know, strictly tending to educational needs. You can, you know, you can spend ten minutes a day when they're this young and just gradually add certain things, 10 minutes on each subject, I mean, so that mm -hmm. at most maybe you're doing about an hour or maybe you can break it up during different points of the day. And I tried it, and it relieved so much stress um, because, you know, when you're homeschooling, you have, well, at least, you know, some of us, we had, you know, certain pressures that, um, you know, you're, you want your child to do as well as another child would, would do with all those extra resources. Um, and then, you know, the studies say that automatically, though, the fact that, you know, you love your child, your child sees you all the time, and the fact that your child is always learning and that they're with you 24-7, um, you know, 12 months usually out of the year is different from a situation where they're, you know, at school at 8, maybe leave at 3, you know, and they have to come back with other children for attention um, and they only go to school for maybe 10 months out of the year. And, you know, usually they don't get to finish any of the textbooks. That's different from a homeschool That's situation true. where, that, that you know, it's, I'm sorry? I was saying that is definitely true. I mean, I've yeah, never I finished books in, in high school, junior high, mm -mm. or college. <laughs> is that or college? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the class is college. not finished. That's right. Right. The class is not finished. The the textbook. Whereas at home, you know, you have you have uh you know, as a parent you have the acute knowledge of what your child probably understands, what they don't understand, how they learn and you know, you can hone in on that and really skip a lot of the things that would have to go on at school, such as, you know, getting ready, moving from class to class, you know, taking time away to yell at other students, um, and, you know, doing busy work, whereas basically as a homeschooler, it's really like you're tutoring. Your child has a tutor, and, you know, in, in public school or private school, the child really doesn't get 
uh, specialized attention like that unless they fail at something. And then they would right. get a tutor. Then they would get that one-on-one treatment. And, and all naturally, their grade or, you know, um, how they're evaluated, they're, they would test stronger simply because they got that one-on-one. With a homeschool situation, they're getting that from day one. Um, so, you know, we're also, you know, sometimes the question comes up, well, do you do we um, do we offer support for you know for mothers that send their children to school sometimes or you know half a year? Um, yes, we do because you know it's not we're not condemning um, the public education system because we're too busy teaching our own kids, teaching our own children. Right. Um, we're not um, condemning you know mothers that they send their children to school full time because. Uh, you know, the homeschool aspect is we do what we do with our children, you do what you do, but when we get together, <laughs> we are, you know, it's all about the socialization. So um, we're open to that. Uh, most of the children that we have now are um, around about 11 years old and younger. Right. And um, they get along very well. Um, right. What's the highest age that you go to? We don't really have a limit. We don't really have a limit okay. because um, okay. we we don't we don't have a limit because there's you know one mother she has uh, had taken her child out of school I think when he was in middle school and now he's in college. So you know sometimes you know we're around it when we're around him they you know offer he offers different um, inspiring. Uh, information to the to the children because you know he didn't do the so-called traditional route, um, and uh, when you have uh, different mothers involved in a program like this, they offer their different experiences. So you know, some of us have graduated college, uh, some of us haven't. Um, you know, have our GED. So again, it's not really you know. A situation where you know we're being egotistical or anything like that, and saying you know well our children are going to do you know uh, better, and we were totally unwelcoming to to mothers that have their children in, in a public school or private school situation. That's not the case. We have some members that send their um you know that are, have the little ones and sending their children to you know daycare or something like that. Um, but for the most part is a resource that, you know, if you want to train your child at home, there's different ways to go about it. Whatever is best for you and your family, that's what you do. Um, we're not about yeah. judging everyone. We're just about being able to offer resources and support is our main focus. Right. Okay, okay. Now, so the thing is about support. And, of course, right. our whole thing is about uplifting fallen humanity. Um, right. Some of the things that we get, get a chance to teach these young sisters, um, like you said, has been positive influences, you know, within the home. You know, definitely within the home, because it changes. Um, have their grades, you know, you know, from public school, you know, coming to, you know, to the institution, coming to your program, and then the grades increase as far as in, even in public school? As far as I've I've encountered, yes. Um, I know uh, the the children, when they get to interact with each other, it's, you know, it's encouraging for them. Um, because, you know, if you're in a homeschool situation, you don't, you do not have that, you know, tremendous uh, classroom situation where you're with so many other children and they're all doing the same thing. So sometimes, um, I mean, this is another aspect where it helps to get, you know, with other children that um, learn in different ways and how their parents, you know, use different methods. When they get together, it's much more encouraging, especially when we do the science projects. Um, they get very excited, you know, about the things that we do together. And when they go home, they're more encouraged to, you know, to listen to whoever's, you know, uh, performing the lessons, whether it be the mother, the father, or grandparent, or whomever. They're more um, 
they have more of an incentive to learn because then when they get together, they can talk about what they learned at home and show each other. So, you know, then it becomes kind of like a show and tell type of thing. Um, and as far as, you know, grades improving, um, as far as I know, all the children are are up at least a level from where they commonly would be if they were to attend public school. Um, and that's because, you know, as a parent, you not to down teachers or anything like that, but as a parent, you are going to care more about your child. Um, no doubt. On a, you know, on a standard type of basis uh, or on an average basis, you're, you know, the parent is more concerned, so they're going to put in more effort there, um, you know, and then this is also, it's not just your child's future, it's your future. This person could potentially take care of you in the future. This person, you know, um, is, you know, the person that's going to be handling your lineage and, you know, your legacy into the future. So you want to make sure that they're capable and competent enough to handle that. That's also something that all the mothers that are involved in this share. Um, it's not... Uh, the type of situation where things can just fall in between the cracks. Um, so that's another reason why, you know, um, the, the children perform better is because, you know, this, we feel as though there's a little bit more at stake than just, you know, learning about, um, you know, the first president and all of that um, and how this ties into, you know, being aboriginal or, you know, being Washington is that, you know, being able to train your own child within your own lineage um, and giving them information about their history and picking the subjects that they learn um, and deciding which subjects to discard uh, depending on your child and what they're interested in, that's, that's paramount. Um, and again, no within successful nations, <laughs> right, within successful nations, you know, for us, by us type of thing, you know, it starts, even if you have your child in different places in the world, even if your child uh, attends, you know, public school where everybody looks like them, the teachers look like them, who they're learning about looks like them, um, and they, they, they still, when they go home, they have family lessons that go on. Um, so the, the unit of the family is very, very important, and, you know, being at home, they have a better chance of learning about home economics, and the parents can make that uh, a broader type of teaching uh, system than is normally taught in school. I was talking about that with actually the other day with um, one of my um, fellow homeschool association members. She were, was talking about how um, <clears throat> how that. That's you know that's not really taught today in these schools uh, about how to balance a checkbook and yes. how to you know how to um, you know plan family meals and how to these are all things that you know actually happen and how to you know family planning when you want to have your children all that you know it's something that each culture and each nation has to decide for themselves depending on you know their history their makeup. There, um, even you know, right down to the DNA. There's certain things that are just different about folks that um, it's easier to deal with that if you're in charge of that. You That's know, true. It's, it's not so much about. Um, and then another aspect of it as well is is the unschooling. Sometimes um, uh, we hear about mothers who have sent their children into public school and then they want to take them out. And then they're wondering right. about, you know, well, I have to, but I still have to maintain, you know, this level of learning for my child and um, still have to make sure that the child is operating and functioning on the level of other children that actually attend public school. But then at the same time, kind of want to, you know, clean their brain out from what they learned at school. You have that going on too. And, um, you know, it's different for every family, you know, depending on how many children they have and, um, you know, how old their children are and, and you know, the, the different tasks and things that the mother has to do or the father has to do on a regular, everyday basis, but it can be done. Um, that, and, you know, the Homeschool Association membership with us really to help alleviate all of that, to make it um, easier and not feel so impossible 
when you think, you know, okay, well, I'm just one parent of this child, and maybe they would get more from an actual school district. Um, in certain aspects, yes, but, you know, if you really look at the school performances these days, in several aspects, that's not going to happen. It is, you know, more beneficial in, in several ways to just train your child at home. You're right, no doubt. And training the child at home definitely, um, like you said, when it takes a village to raise a child, you know, it definitely um, you need um, everyone participating in this effort in order to, you know, make sure that child, um, you know, is nurtured, you know, in a proper manner. And therefore, you know, and when they when they have questions, you know, that they actually get answers, you know, and not feel like, you know, some of us might have, you know, felt growing up. You know, I know like in particular I was told that, you know, you don't question God, you don't question the pastor, you don't. So I'm like, well, you know, that's the case, then who do I question? You know. Um, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then eventually, you know, I ended up not having the question. I just ended up, you know, finding on my own, do much research and study my own answers. You know, and um, that's the way that it's been. So, you know, for those who have gone through that type of school of self-initiation also, and then as they might have got older and got their own, you know, got other initiations or whatever the case is, then they understand the relevance and the significance of, you know, of these initiations, you know, and coming from an indigenous perspective, um, um, like you said, African cultural perspective, um, indigenous or Moorish or whatever the case is, um, is the same thing. You know, when you do compared to religious studies, you don't go into the various religions um, with the thought of finding things in which they are separate and divide. You know, when you do comparative religious studies, you go in attempting to find the connecting pieces and how to make things holistic, you know, and seeing where right. each one derives from, you know, and that's the mentality in which that we need to have, you know, um, and therefore there would be less confusion, you know. However, you know, our people have a tendency of separation and dividing, you know, and uh, we understand what that, you know, what that, you know, eventually cause, and that's conquered, you know. So, you know, if you want to have that mentality, you know, looking at everything in life, then, you know, we put ourselves in a in a self-defeating um, position. We we ourselves, you know, um, have, you know, put ourselves as a, as a conquered people, you know, based on that mentality right. alone. So we have to begin to start being more right hemisphere thinking and start being more holistic, you know, and, um, you know, doing what we need to do in that particular regard. Um, let me go to the phone lines and see if there's anyone. Yeah, we got questions. We got question from 215, question or comment from 215, area code 215 is on the line. Peace. This is Peace. Peace. Hey, hey, Um, I um, I was calling just to comment um, and yes. to uh, thank my sister. Um, Jules L. Bay. Um, I'm going yeah. to her with the Homeschool Association. I want the other parents here in, um, locally in Philadelphia. And um, one of the wonderful things that I wanted to point out about having a homeschool association is that um, we uh, we even allow like some you know just an option. I mean, here in our city, the school district is you know they almost didn't open this year. So a lot of parents who even work, um, you know, would like to have options for their children to go. And we do uh, assist, you know, parents who do work who may want to homeschool their children to, you know, right, be homeschooled by one of us. Right. You've been hearing that there's been a lot of school closing there within the Philadelphia um, area. Yes, a lot of school, a lot of mergers, a lot of older kids are now right. mixing with the younger kids and, you know, mm -hmm. that development between those ages are just very vast and there is not necessarily, you know, you have overcrowdedness, you have, you know, younger children, you may have 40, 30 to 40 kids in a classroom, like first and second graders, and that's kind of horrible. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so, what happens is there's a lot of parents who work and they worry about their children, um, you know, in, in the schools, and they're like, well, what can you do? I wish I could homeschool. But we have a lot of mothers who are homeschooling 
and far in, in the way that you know we looked at it, like they can have the opportunity to have their children homeschooled. There's, you know, either our personal methods and our systems that we have set up as far as educating. There's also, um, you know, other state you know um, options as far as doing the online schools and things like that. And we will, you know, assist them with doing like the um, life skills training uh, that they don't get in schools, like how to cook, you know, how to, you know, plant some things, you know, in, the, in your garden, and as well as some of the other things that um, they just wouldn't necessarily get exposed to outside of the home. Like perhaps, you know, like my 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 son um, was, I took him out in middle school, and he's now in college, and um, you know, he. He he was exposed to things like meditation and yoga and martial arts from he was four years old. So being able to keep that balance with him um, when he's gotten to the school system, because he was just exposed to so many different things, he kind of had, you know, some social issues, not just with um, his peer group, but sometimes with the um, authority figures in, in the schools and um, having a, male child in the in the urban, you know, environment, you know, who's melanated is definitely something that I feel is very important that we bring them home and give them what they need because they're suffering in these schools greatly. And I don't know if everyone's aware of that, but people who are listening just know that they are doing things to those children. And it's not physically, but it's definitely psychologically. And, it's, you know, if you can, if you know someone who does, you can help a you can help a, a, a mother who's at home generate you know a, a couple extra dollars income. You know where it's going. The child's being educated, and now your community is being empowered because you're limiting the amount of um, you know broken children that you have in your communities. And you can also have the freedom to teach well whatever it is you choose to teach them the right correct history. Um, you know, that they're not going to get when they go other places. So that's really all I wanted to say. And I just wanted to, you know, I'm just with let um, Jules know that I'm very proud of her. And um, I'll talk to her later. Thank you. No doubt. No doubt. We're all proud of her. And, um, you know, also, um, she being a chief in United Washington. Um, we also, let me say this, we have an event coming up with Washington, the Empire Washington, and that's June. Um, um, 18th, 19th, and 20th. That's that Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, Juneteenth celebration is going to be in Monroe, Louisiana. So we definitely want to put that word out for those that um, um need to come, want to come. I suggest you come. Um, I'm going to be a guest speaker. Um, so um, definitely check that out. That's June 17th, 18th, and 19th. Well, yeah, 18th, 19th, and 20th. Excuse me. Um, so we're going to be in Monroe, Louisiana. So for those that want more information, just hit me up in my email. Um, that's drdalimelbay.com. That's D-R-A-L-I-M-E-L-B-E-Y, um, excuse me, at gmail.com. All right, so um, check us out. All right, we're going to go to the phone line. Thanks, goddess. Um, we're going to go to area code 229, area code 229. You're on the line. Greetings. Area code two two nine. Hey. Yeah, yeah, Doctor Eileen Bay, I got a question for you about um. Yes. I I went on your website, and um, I got books by Madame Levatsky, Manly Palmer mm-hmm. Hall, and 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 I and um, and and then you talk about the Jews. I got books by Jew. I got the Talmud and Mishnah. And I also got the Circle Seven Quran, and my question is this right here: Should we be? But I also got books by Dr. Malachi York. Should we be following Noble Drew Ali or Dr. Malachi York? Which one should I be? For, or can I follow them both? Yeah, brother. Um, the, like I said earlier, the thing is about um, connecting the pieces. You know what I'm saying? Each one have come along. These are all prophets, apostles, messiahs. Um, whatever term that we want to use, if we want to use the biblical terminology for it, but these are messengers in which that have come along over the last 100 years or so in which that have brought enlightenment to us 
in order to get ourselves from out of the predicament that we have caught ourselves up into. Um, so, like I said earlier, this is about the upliftment of fallen humanity. So, um, you understand, and when you do your research, you're looking at things as a seeker, all right? So, you might, you know, have your opinion or you might have someone in which that you feel more, um, or that you might lean more towards, such as if you're um, studying Dr. York, or if you, you know, Dr. York is still alive, you know, um, Prophet Noble Dralee is not, even though Dr. York is in prison. Um, you can get, you know, what is left of um, basically everything which that we have on Prophet Noble Dralee. You, you, you can get the um, Moorish Holy Quran Circle 7. You can get the 101s, the 102. You can get the Moorish literature. You know, you can get, you know, different other little books, you know, from the teachings of Prophet Noble Dralee. Um you know, from what I know, Dr. York is still writing books right now, even from prison. You know, so, you know, there's always something in which that you might, you know, obtain as far as information that is still coming. It might still be relevant for you and your very existence. The, the whole thing, brother, is about, you know, awakening your higher self. You know, not necessarily to follow anyone, but to use them in order to um, act as a stepping stone into your own enlightenment. As we were saying, okay. Can I ask one more question, Doctor Aline? Yes. Yes. I went on your your website and it said the Moore's Zionist Temple in Brooklyn, New York. So can you right. be a Moore and be a Zionist? Um. Yes. Um. As a matter of fact, a Zionist is just the term in which that is a biblical term. The um the European, when they, you know, stole the land from the Palestinians. They are the ones in which that, you know, were the Jewish Zionists. And this is what is actually being, you know, controlled right now by the, you know, um, via the Vatican slash, you know, London banks as far as the finances, you know, as well as the banking system. And then also through the United States, you know, um, every president have to go and, you know, go to the well and wall, you know, and everything. And, you know, you see Barack Obama, he had his um, yarmulke on, you know, so forth and so on. So we understand that this is actually what's going on. But the Zionists, you know, if you get the book, what is called the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, uh, which is a book or, you know, information which that came out over 100 years ago, um, it speaks about how these Zionists were actually trying to control, you know, the world, you know, through its various... Um, you know, I guess, you know, such as religion, politics, sex, labor, law, so forth and so on. It has its tentacles. We now refer to them as the Illuminati, you know, but this was yeah. a plan in which that got out over 100 years ago, you know, in which that we're now just catching up to as far as that is concerned. You know, now the now the word Zion is actually just simply come from Mount Zion, you know, um, which metaphysically, if you get the book, what is called Metaphysical Bible Dictionary by Charles Fillmore, he tell you that Zion simply means the highest peak, which actually is in reference to um, the deepest level of consciousness, which is actually infinite consciousness, which is collective consciousness. That is actually symbolic to Zion. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you say the proto tools of the elders of Zion. It was a book called The Secret Instructions of the Jesuits. I thought they wrote that book. Um, all of them is the same, brother. You know what I'm saying? That's what I okay. said. I said via, when I said via the Vatican, I'm talking about the Jesuits, which is the assassins of the Vatican, of the Pope, in particular the Black Pope, which is the head of the um, Jesuits. Okay. All right. Thank you, Doctor Bay. Right now. Thank you, brother. Um, we'll go. My co-host, Dr. Fahim, you have any questions or anything that you want to build on? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask the sister uh, uh, about the um, – I'm teaching the young young, young girls, young sisters, rather, uh, how uh, do they deal with, uh, like, you know, that they are not black and dealing and not African-Americans and how they deal with, with their parents and friends and relatives alike, how how – 
Do they do she have any problem with that? As far as them feeling whether whether or not they have a nationality and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. You know that. People, um, go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, some people might say, well, no. Uh, them, a lot of people, like most people, like still call themselves black. You know. And things like that. Uh, how did they, the, the girl, little girls deal with like their parents? May may not be into that. What they're into, the rites of passage is what you're taking them through. <coughs> and how do they well, deal with? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh-huh. They you, well, the title of the program is um, Temple of Dendra, um, which is you know an actual temple in Kemet or what some people call Egypt. Um, explain that, uh, what that is, because, you know, that's uh, a part of, essentially one of the logos that we use is the actual, you know, uh, out of the black and white photo that, you know, most folks are familiar with, with the zodiac, the oldest um, zodiac uh, on the ceiling there, um, display, uh, and, it's, you know, Temple of Dendra, Rites of Passage for African Daughters. You know, that is really for African daughters so that you know who it's for. Um, you know, some people may, you know, have issues with, you know, okay, well, I don't feel that I'm African or, you know, um, I don't, you know, they may not feel a connection with Africa, but when it says Temple of Dendra, Rites of Passage for African daughter, you know who it's for. And I don't have to be ashamed of that. I don't have to feel like I'm being racist or anything like that because, you know, Jewish women have things for them. Um, exactly. You know, Bob, you know, and, and all kinds of other women have things for their women, and you don't even hear about it because in most cases it's in a language you don't speak and it's written in a in a script that you don't understand. So you exactly. don't have to, you know, they don't have to really have to deal with that. As far as dealing with um, people who feel that they are black, um, again, I'm not gearing this specifically, and I have never really geared this specifically towards the alleged conscious community. This is for, you know, most of those little girls who have, uh, you know, who have mothers that claim to be conscious, they get a lot of this at home already. Um, So that's one of the reasons why I'm not, not to say that I won't welcome them. I definitely will welcome those little girls. It's just that um, I'm keeping it open by saying African. I could have said, uh, I could change it and say Moorish. I could change it and say, you know, Alkebulon. I could say, you know, change it and say a maximum. But when I say African, you know who that is. Everybody knows who that is. And, exactly. you know, usually you're not going to be offended by that because um, that's not meant to be, you know, uh, offensive or anything like that. That's, you know, the common term that I can use to help people identify what this is all about and who it's for. Um, and as far as the mothers coming in, that um, I really haven't, you know, if you're going to come into this, you're you're coming into this understanding that they are going to learn about African culture. They are right. going to, you know, and then um, I do have to, you know, let them know who I am, what I'm about, what the program is going to instill, and usually they just get excited about it because there really aren't too many places that they're going to get this, which is why, you know, um, I get very excited about it when I'm talking and, um uh, it's it's filled with so many different aspects, and I try to make the most of every single minute that I'm with the little girl because I know that once they leave, they may not, you know, something may occur where they may not be able to come back, and it may not have anything to do with, you know, the, the program, you know, being uh, Afrocentric or Pan-African or Moorish or Indigenous or Aboriginal. It could just be that, well, you know, the parents are divorced and it's Daddy's weekend, so I'm not going to see her that weekend. You see what I'm okay. saying? There's so many other mm-hmm. things that go on um, that I'm not really, I'm not, I mean, and that's something that it's too important of a issue that, you know, this is lacking for, you know, if a parent were to come in and say that, you know, well, I have an issue, well, you can take your child and, you know, go somewhere else that you feel more comfortable. I'm not making you, <laughs> you know, I'm not exactly. making you say, mm-hmm. and, you know, if you feel that this is not right for your daughter, you're her parent. I'm not the parent. I'm, you know, a teacher. I'm a guide. I'm, you know, and I have certain responsibilities, you know, and, and things that I, you know, have been entrusted to do that I have to do. So, um, 
and again, being that it's lacking, uh, you know, when I was, I actually uh, studied this in college, uh, in undergrad, my major was history, my minors were African American studies, international studies, and women's studies. So I have, you know, I have, you know, studied this academically. Um, I do other things for women, uh, with my women's ministry being a high priestess. There's um, different things that I do uh, as far as, you know, different spiritual readings and consultations that, you know, if a mother actually does have an issue, I can actually, uh, you know, comment or suggest or give advice on, you know, if she wants to feel more comfortable about it or if she doesn't understand certain things, I can explain it from several different aspects depending on what she's feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but if a person is dead set, I'm not going to force them because uh, that's going to take right. time away from more important things. Right. So right. right. Well, we know that within the Ashanti culture, you know, they have a proverb in which that states that the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. Right. Yeah. So, right. Um, you know, so so we're really looking at, you know, what can counteract and counterbalance, you know, the negativity in which that is taking place. You know, right now we've seen a overwhelming, um, so I don't even want to say, but, I mean, of homosexuality. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. And we want to talk about, I mean, I, would, I thought about it when Neverhead was talking about, you know, the schools closing in Philadelphia. It right. reminded me of the main, one of the other points is that, like what you just said, as a nation, it is your responsibility to teach your children and your adults, your elderly, to take care of them, to tend to them, to train them, to teach them, to employ them, to feed them, to clothe them, you know, to house them. That's your responsibility. That's nobody else's responsibility. No um, mm-hmm. I listened a couple years ago on a on another call where they were talking about, uh, you know, uh, so called you know black uh, hairstylists that wanted to open up their salons that you know had to deal with this basic blockade with, I guess, Koreans uh, or, you know, some type of or some, some Asians basically having a monopoly on owning hair or hair shops, yeah. beauty supplies. And the response from, you know, the Asians were, you know, well, y'all don't supply for each other. Y'all don't service each other. And, you know, you can't be mad at me for, you know, making a living for my family by servicing you. You should be servicing mm-hmm. your people. You haven't? Oh, well. You know, you left the door open for somebody else to do it. Right, right. So, you know, folks, they like to complain about the white man did this and the white man, okay, well, nobody's, you know, really stopping you in your spare time from putting something together. Uh, when I put the Temple of Dender Rights of Passage program together, I was working full time. Mm-hmm. Um, I had just graduated college, and I put it together on my own. I was very, very excited about it. Again, I had just finished up the um, the Queen of Fluids Sacred Rights or Sacred um, Sacred Woman um, Development Personal Development System, and um, I liked how that went. But like I said before that, before I even found out about that, I was searching for something like that for myself. Um, I liked uh, what I found out about when I was in school. I was trying my best to learn about Africa before colonialism. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, that's when you ask the question, well, it, well, you know, if someone gets offended or they don't feel a connection with Africa and, you know, uh, they don't feel a connection with being indigenous, they don't have to, but I'm presenting it. I'm not saying that at the end of it, you have to do anything. You know, if a mother, just, I mean, in the past I have done, um, different things where, you know, you could have your daughter come in maybe for one session, but, you know that um, that started to disturb the continue, the, you know, the continuity of uh, of the process because you know the 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 discussions that we have get kind of personal, right? For you know for the young ladies and we want them to feel very comfortable. That kind of environment is not something that all of those little girls get at home. It's not something that they have at school or you know even in private. So. Um, this kind of atmosphere where they can just, you know, feel that they're loved and nurtured and ask questions, but they're also disciplined, educated, and trained on, you know, um, accepting themselves and accepting who they are 
learning about where they, you know, really come from, learning about themselves astrologically and, you know, finding about, you know, how numerology and all that can help them. Um, it's not, you know, some folks would, would kind of judge that and say, okay, well, you know, it's just a system where they're learning about occult sciences. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's with, what they'll uh, say. With, yeah, with that, um, it's not just that. We have, um, it, this is all, again, the occult sciences that the main word in there is cult. And that comes from culture, right? And you know, when you see when you see other folks being themselves, you don't say, "Oh, well, they're practicing occult sciences." You don't really right. say that. Right. See, they're yeah. being themselves. That's you know, I expect him to you know do certain things because you know of his of his cultural heritage and background. Right. But with us, you know, you get all kinds of folks get a little bit too judgmental. And say, yeah. oh, you need to behave more American. You need to be more assimilated. You're supposed to give all that stuff away, and you know, um, right. yeah, right. really spooked out about certain things that really aren't that deep. I mean, if right. you think astrology, <laughs> yeah, they numerology, just about that. I mean, I'm a, sure do. right. It's like I'm, I'm, you know, I keep that that type of thing light. I do provide, you know, different ceremonies and rituals and things if they would like to come, but I'm not forcing that down anybody's throat. Exactly, I'm not. And, yeah. um, you know, when you have uh, folks in different religious positions, um, you know, just, just hearing about some of the things that I do, you know, it's very beneficial. And it's, you know, all about personal development, all about, you know, personal evolution and spiritual evolution. It has nothing to do with anything negative. Um, exactly. But automatically, you know, for some people, when they hear about the word African, they get, you know, all kinds of spooked out. And, I mean, that's not, you know, most most likely that's not the type of person I want in my program anyway. Even the word occult, because, they get spooked out. Right. So, I mean, I'm open to, you know, inviting little girls that have absolutely never heard the word Moorish. I'm open to parents that, you know, um, that feel like they want to be more in touch with their with their culture, and that's usually who I get. Um and by the end of it, you know, they you know, they they feel more calm and they feel more at ease and they feel like they really are uh servicing their children and not just being parents and they actually I mean a lot of them really seem to feel like they're doing a better job at parenting because they have um this type of thing going on. Um uh, where they can meet up with other uh parents who um care in the way that, that they do about making sure that their children learn about their heritage um, mm -hmm. from more than just, uh, you know, Black History Month. Right. So, uh -huh. Which is a joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, pretty, it's very beneficial in, in several different ways. Yes. Uh, when, you, when you speak of a cult, you talk about the hidden culture uh, that our people have to, uh, uh, has been uh, uh, hidden, hidden from us from, for many, many years. And that's why all you teaching the young girls, you know. Right. The, the hidden culture of our people, of our ancestors. And uh uh I was used to be an instructor at the Prince Hall uh Masonic Temple here in the St. Louis Missouri Republic. And uh what I about uh teaching them was the uh occult side of more science, which is what they call masonry. And uh, I had some feedback at it. They said that I was teaching uh, uh, satanic, uh, doing satanic teachings, you know. And, I mean, that, that just shows you how really uh, our people has really, uh, what you call, mind control to, to, to the extent that they can't really understand or comprehend what we're really trying to teach them. Right. Yeah, I try my best not to get involved in debates about religion. Um, I've been a Reiki master. You know, I practice a lot of different things, um, and you know, being a high priestess, I'm in in the order. I'm in Indigenous Cosmic Golden Ray Order of Melchizedek. I was initiated, you know, by the pre Prince of Lima Bay and the Princess Kadira. Um, mm. Within that, I have mm, to study wonderful. all religions. I have to study all religions, more so from um, 
the 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 text. I, I really more so study the text than the way that um that you know mainstream folks practice it. Um, I like to travel to different you know um, different events where folks are getting connected with their higher self, with the connecting with their you know their creator and their sense of spirituality. Um, and, you know, that point of nirvana or enlightenment or, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, becoming a bodhisattva or, um, you know, having direct experiences with the divine. That is the realm that I tend to dwell in. Um, So coming down from that, I mean, that's, that's high above a lot of different areas where, you know, there's a lot of bickering on whose religion is the best and yeah. whose crew, you know, rocks it the hardest and <laughs> who right. can get you there the quickest. I don't really deal with all of that um, no. I because right. I can sit down and read, you know, the Tao Te Ching, you know, the, I read the, the Holy Bible, the 1611 version, and, you know, the, the Holy Quran. I read all of them within the same five minute time span and can get so much out of it. Um right. and I'm still expanding. Um and being a high priestess, you know, I have to be in direct communication with the ancestors and high divine ascended masses all the time. Mm-hmm. So to come at me with, you know, oh well, such and such is demonic, you know, in the early days when it, before I became a priestess, I had to deal with oh you know, locks are demonic. Mm-hmm. And you know, Afrocentrism that was a fad. You know, you can't make no money off of that. But that's mm-hmm. not <laughs> Right. I'm not you know, it's not good, you know, no matter what you're into, it's not very good to stay where you're not gonna be nurtured. You know, I'm right. not a glutton for self abuse. So I'm not gonna stay in that type of situation. I don't really um I don't really put myself in situations where I have to uh defend I don't feel like I have to defend anything. Right. Um, usually in those conversations, those people that come at me usually end up having to defend themselves because, exactly. you know, mm-hmm. whatever you practice, you're supposed to be um, operating from a different mental state where that really is you're supposed to see, be able to see the good in everything and, you know, whatever you're practicing, you should be so busy practicing that, working on your own development, you shouldn't be worried about mine. I mean, right. if I'm working with your child, you do have the right to, to ask certain questions, but... You know, invading personal space and being derogative and insulting, that will not, no. <laughs> it's unacceptable. Um, mm-hmm. And if you want me to, you know, especially in a situation where you're dealing with children, you know, uh, you're not going to ask certain questions of, you know, public school educators or, you know, other folks that deal with your children. So why would you ask, you know, certain uh, unnecessary questions of me? That's right. another issue amongst uh, right. mm-hmm. uh, so-called black people that comes up where, you know, your own, someone that looks like you, you know, the standards that you have for that person are so much higher than the people you drop your children off at every single day. Right. Or the strangers you let, you know, uh, deal with them for eight or nine hours out of day. If I'm dealing with a child for, you know, four hours once a week, that's, you know, totally different, <laughs> totally different atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually, like I said, I don't have to, I don't really have to deal with that. And even um, with my private practice as a Reiki master, uh, I've only, I've only had one person come to me and say that that was, you know, the Reiki is demonic, or um, that, uh, and that was after she had come, she had experienced it, she had dealt with the healing, and the reason why she brought that up was because she couldn't believe she had such a wonderful experience with it. She learned so much about herself that she couldn't, she only mentioned that just to say, I can't believe people say that this is demonic. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Right. So, um, yeah, that's not, that, I mean, and it's for someone to bring that up, uh, that tells you, you know, where they live. Usually when someone exactly. says something like that, it's that they live in a state of fear, that they don't want to go outside of their comfort zone that they really, you know, they have this need to have you agree with them and feel right and correct. Um, and I don't really, I don't have that need to please people on that level. I'm very right. honest um, in what I do, and, you know, there's full disclosure. I encourage the parents 
the mothers at least, the mothers or you know the whoever the motherly guardian is of the of the young lady is to come and participate. That's open. Um, that invitation is always open because it shouldn't just be me in the conversation. The girls will not get <laughs> as full of an experience as they should. Um, mm-hmm. And even with the homeschool association, one of the requirements, if you'd like to become a member, is that you will have to volunteer at least one hour of your time within a uh, three-month time span of your membership to teach um, an hour of something that you specialize in. Mainly that's so that, you know, the network grows and all the children will experience something that they may not otherwise be exposed to. Right. So it's, um, you know, each one to each one, the community support, resources, you know, mm-hmm. we have to go back to that mind state where we really feel that a person is valuable, more so that, you know, valuing what's in their pocket. Right. Right. That, no, that no. was some time ago when I had that experience. That was about 10 years ago. It could have been longer than that. Yeah. But I learned from that experience uh, mm-hmm. so not to do that. So, so. Right. But you, you're so right about that. Right. And, I mean, the other thing about that is, too, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I have that authority as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not, um, you know, I'm properly ordained, I properly practiced, so... You know, if someone comes, you know, at you know, a person like that with uh, that kind of an issue, it's more so of a learning experience or, you know, okay, well, obviously you have some kind of issue going on with the chakras or, you know, there's something right. going on in your aura mm-hmm. where exactly. you're just not even welcoming this type of experience. I look at it from that aspect, not as like, oh, I'm going to holler and scream at this person because they they're trying to challenge me. Mm-hmm. You have the right, you know, everyone has the right to ask questions. And as long as you're coming at it, uh, in the opinion that you're actually saying whatever you're saying in that regard to learn something or to, you know, you're open to maybe being incorrect or, you know, doing some more research, uh, it's fine. But mm-hmm. um, I have not had to deal, to date I have not had to deal with, um, I mean, other than personally just, you know, having locks or, you know, um, the way that I carry myself, my personal self, that, you know, being the first one in my area to do certain things, that I've been challenged. But as far as my work, no, because it's way too beneficial. So mm, wonderful. Yeah. No doubt. Also, um, talking about the March twenty first, twenty second, twenty third event, as well as also what you will be bringing to the event, so that when people come, they can um expect a little something, something. All right, well, I was waiting to talk about that. I um, am very, very excited about this because <laughs> it's been a while, and I'm getting to go to a, a Spring Equinox, a Unity Washington Spring Equinox event um, where I will be doing aura readings um, and chakra readings, chi readings, totem readings, uh, numerology readings, and Akashic record readings. And to explain them briefly, um, I am a seer. I'm able to see, um, you know, certain things in the unseen realm. And that has taken a lot of work, lots of meditation, my initiation into the Cosmic Golden Ray Order of Melchizedek definitely helped out a lot with that. Practicing Reiki for several years has helped out with that. Um, and I've been able to um, look at, well, Develop a talent where you look at um, the auras. I have had teachers that specifically train me um, or help to, you know, open that eye and all of that um, so that I'm able to do this, to read auras, um, and I use that same ability to look into a person's chakras. Um, I have heard that, you know, you can get, um, what is it, an aura and chakra. Or no, I think it's just the aura um, photography done where you can get a picture taken. What I do is I'm not using any machines, I'm not using any cards or anything like that. I actually read a person's raw energy and can give you insight on, you know, as far as the aura reading, that's mainly to tell you whether or not um, your aura is expanding, if it's contracting, if you have blockages in it that um, would hinder you from experiencing certain things that you actually want to. That may answer some questions as to why you may feel some stagnation. Another um, reading that I do are the uh, chakra readings, 
which um, usually at an event like this, I'll be able to read the major seven uh, chakras and beyond that. Uh, if a person is, you know, developed or ascended to certain levels of high degrees, you be able to see above the seven chakras, um, to see, you know, the soul chakra, the God chakra, and chakras beyond that, where I'm able to tell you, you know, whether or not uh, they are vibrating the way that they should be, if there's any blockages there, if you have um, any negative energy or hooks or roots or anything like that, I'm able to tell you that, um, and how they would be affecting, you know, your life uh, in certain aspects. Um, each chakra, you know, has a different uh, area of life that it governs. So, you know, depending on the functionality of each chakra, um, and every reading for every person has been totally different. No two people, you know, or the chakras or chi or anything that I've read were exactly the same. Um, moving on into the chi system, that has to do with your vitality, uh, and where your energy actually flows into different areas of your life. Whereas um, if you feel that, again, if you're dealing with some type of stagnation, there may have been some kind of traumatic event that have occurred that, you know, maybe you haven't really moved through your emotions or you avoid dealing with certain things. Just uh, a week ago I had someone uh, had to do a, a chi reading where the person, very, very strong in her will, um, but because of, you know, a past uh, romantic relationship, she totally diverted her attention from uh, from actually entering into another romantic relationship. That, mm. that Those kinds of decisions that a person would make has a direct effect on how your energy flows. These are not coincidences. It is not hogwash. This is actually, you know, this is real life in motion, um, and you do exist on different planes. Um Totem readings that I do uh, are a lot like, you know, uh, shaman readings where, um, you know, let's say you were living in a traditional, you know, back in the day type of village situation where when you come of age, maybe you're sent out to the village and you have to go for days walking without food or water and you uh, have uh, this experience where you see this great bear spirit that tells you what you're supposed to do with your life. Mm -hmm. I'm actually able to see the animal spirit and the medicine that, are, that they're bringing to the person just by looking at them with their permission. All of these readings I do with the person's permission to look into their energy field because whatever I see, I'm responsible to tell you about. Um, mm -hmm. The other reading that I do is uh, numerology and uh, Akashic Record. With the numerology readings, you can find out about um, the energy that this year brings you. And the the month, you know, it'll tell you the month, uh, the, the cycle that you're in as far as your life path, be able to tell you your destiny number, your characteristic traits. And um, this, is, this information is very helpful because, um, for instance, uh, once I read a woman who, who was trying to buy a house, she was trying to, you know, solidify her situation in a job. She's trying to secure her financial portfolio. But all these things kept happening to um, prevent that from happening. When we did the um, <clears throat> when we did the numerology reading, we found out that she was not in the best year for that. That was absolutely the worst year to try and build a foundation because she was in a year where lots of things were going to change, where mm. things that she had outgrown was going to be removed from her, whether she liked it or not. So, you know, this information helps her to kind of go with the flow instead mm, of, good. you know, fighting with nature. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the basis, one of the main arguments for learning about numerology and astrology um, because you want to learn more about nature so, you know, you can move with it because, you know, your personal nature and the earth's nature and the universe, you know, um, all move together, and when you fight against it, that's when, you know, all the frustration and the lack of understanding and the confusion and all that ensues. Um, and then the last reading that I'll be doing, the last form of reading that I'll be offering at the um, Healing Wings three-day expo um, this weekend is uh, the Akashic Record reading, which is um, basically where you can ask uh, three questions, Present tense, um, and the way that you ask it, I have to be able to say yes or no. 
it was very clear and distinct, and there's no type of confusion or misleading or anything like that um, about things um, to come. All of these, uh, all of these readings um, will be offered at this kind of rate because of you know what's going on, all the things that are going on at the at the event this weekend. I'm just very happy to be able to offer them. Um, and I also offer these these things privately. And I'm saying I have to give out my my uh, business number, which is uh, nine three one six eight two six eight seven eight. Again, uh, these numbers um, are nine three one six eight two. Six eight seven eight. I'll be offering all of those readings at the uh, event this weekend, um, and I still have to uh, find out if I'm, I may be doing some presentations. I'm not sure yet, <laughs> but okay. at the very least, I will be offering the the readings, um, those readings this weekend. All right. All right. Um, any closing comments, um, Brother L? Do you have any closing comments? Uh, yes, uh, I can tell the sister this. I, I can I can see why she's a high priestess. All right. She, de- she definitely has a lot under her belt, man. Like I definitely learned a lot from her too. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Thank the, you. The show was wonderful tonight. Beautiful. Oh yeah, and plus she's wonderful. Awesome, so definitely. <laughs> yes, I'm also a graduate of the Healing Wings Institute. Um, that's definitely helped me going through the Healing Wings Institute. Um, I actually started uh, after I graduated and got my certificates and everything, um, going to school for um, to become a doctor in metaphysics and also a naturopathic doctor. And because of you know the tutelage I got under um, the prince and the princess, I was able to. Um, actually save some money and uh, save some time uh, so I don't have to take all the classes and and things that that everybody else has to do simply because I already have certain, you know, certain trainings under and through the Healing Wings Institute. Mm, Outstanding. Mm -hmm. All right, Goddess Jewel, you have any closing remarks? No, just thank you very much for your time. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone this weekend. Um, no again, my email is yabasagardens at gmail dot com, um, and the phone number is nine three one two six eight seven eight. We can talk and discuss the Sun Moon Rising Stars Homeschool Association and the Temple of Dendra Rice of Passage Training System, the program uh, to be held in Philadelphia for the first time in Philadelphia uh, this summer. Thank you. Well, we definitely appreciate you um, for coming on, um, giving out that information. Um, Everybody y'all heard was getting ready to take place this weekend. Uh, She's getting ready to do something serious. Um, So y'all better be here. I'm telling you, boy. You know, I'm going to be getting readers myself, so y'all might have to wait in line. All right? So... (laughs) 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 All right. So... Wonderful. um, See y'all here again next Wednesday, um, 8 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time. And on um, First World Order Radio, we out. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. Begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earth
happy state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetic of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceeding in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetic of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this is, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. <laughs>